The following clip is an excerpt from my book review and analysis of The Gulag Archipelago Volume 1 by Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Now here is a little biographical information about Alexander Solzhenitsyn that I think is worth knowing before watching. Alexander I. Solzhenitsyn was born in Kislovodsk, Russia on December 11, 1918. He earned a degree in mathematics and physics from Rostov University and studied literature through a correspondence course from the Moscow Institute of History, Philosophy, and Literature. A captain in the Soviet Army during World War II, he was arrested in 1945 for criticizing Stalin and the Soviet government in private letters. He was sentenced to eight years of incarceration to be followed by perpetual internal exile, but was cleared of all charges in 1957 as part of Nikita Khrushchev's campaign of de-Stalinization. Solzhenitsyn vaulted from unknown schoolteacher to internationally famous writer in 1962 with the publication of his novella One Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich, which Khrushchev himself authorized. The writer's increasingly vocal opposition to the regime resulted in another arrest, a charge of treason and expulsion from the USSR in 1974. For 18 years of his exile, he and his family lived in Vermont. In 1994, he returned to Russia, thus fulfilling his long-standing prediction. He died at his home in Moscow on August 3, 2008. Solzhenitsyn's major works include the novels In the First Circle and Cancer Ward, the memoirs The Oak and the Calf, and Invisible Allies, a cycle of historical novels with the series title The Red Wheel, and the monumental history of the Soviet prison system The Gulag Archipelago, which Time magazine named the best nonfiction work of the 20th century. In 1970, Solzhenitsyn received the Nobel Prize in Literature. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I here present to you the clip that you actually wanted to watch whenever you clicked on this video. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we come to the final section of this review and analysis of the Gulag Archipelago, Volume 1. Uh. And this section is called Wisdom Gained Through Suffering. Own nothing. Possess nothing. Buddha and Christ taught us this, and the Stoics and the Cynics. Greedy though we are, why can't we seem to grasp that simple teaching? Can't we understand that with property we destroy our soul? So let the herring keep warm in your pocket until you get to the transit prison rather than beg for something to drink here. And did they give us a two-day supply of bread and sugar? In that case, eat it in one sitting. Then no one will steal it from you and you won't have to worry about it, and you'll be free as a bird in heaven. Own only what you can always carry with you. No languages, no countries, no people. Let your memory be your travel bag. Use your memory. Use your memory. It is those bitter seeds alone which might sprout and grow someday. When persecution comes your way, if it does, um, of course, if you stand up for unpopular truths, then it absolutely will come your way. Uh, only hold on to what's up in here, because what's up in here and in here, that the bastards can't take from you. Now this next passage comes towards the end of this uh, first volume, and this is whenever Solzhenitsyn was actually being moved to um, nicer prisons, because, uh, I mean, it's a very strange thing. Uh, Solzhenitsyn, uh, he credits the only reason that he survived the gulags is because he lied about being a uh, nuclear physicist, and so instead of them, you know, putting him in a regular camp, eventually, whenever they, uh, you know, dug up that fake record, they were like, oh, a nuclear physicist. And so they sent him to an island where it wasn't as bad, where you're forced to work and everything, but it's not as uh, medieval as some of the other camps. And this passage comes whenever Solzhenitsyn was being transferred by different guards across the country, where he had to remain silent in open public, on trains, with regular people. It's just a very interesting passage because, yeah, he's just like, he's in amongst all these normal people, can't say a word about where he's going, about what he's doing, but he has this moment to reflect, like, oh my gosh, look at how much people have, look at how much people take for granted. So I'm just going to read the passage and we'll discuss further. Do not pursue what is illusory, property and position, all that is gained at the expense of your nerves decade after decade and is confiscated in one fell night. Live with a steady superiority over life. Don't be afraid of misfortune and do not yearn after happiness. It is, after all, all the same. The bitter doesn't last forever and the sweet never fills the cup to overflowing. 
It is enough if you don't freeze in the cold and if thirst and hunger don't claw at your insides. If your back isn't broken, if your feet can walk, if both arms can bend, if both eyes see, and if both ears hear, then whom should you envy and why? Our envy of others devours us most of all. Rub your eyes and purify your heart and prize above all else in the world those who love you and who wish you well. Do not hurt them or scold them and never part from any of them in your anger. After all, you simply do not know. It might be your last act before your arrest, and that will be how you are imprinted in their memory. That passage is just beautiful on its face, but uh, you know, there at the end it said, it might be your last act before your arrest. You might as well insert, it might be your last act uh, before your death. And uh, you know, if you're a jerk, if you take your life for granted, if you take the freedom you have for granted, then that is how you will be imprinted on the minds of many. Don't chase things that distract you from what life is all about. Now this next sentence, uh, I don't know, I just thought it was a very wise sentence. This is something to keep in mind though, regarding violence and violence done against you. I'm just gonna read it. A person who is not inwardly prepared for the use of violence against him is always weaker than the person committing the violence. You've gotta be mentally prepared for persecution of the, you know, verbal uh, and spiritual type, but also uh, the physical type. Uh, because if you're not prepared for someone to do heinous, evil things to you, if you're not mentally prepared for that, then, um, you know, those things will compromise you. Uh, you will submit when you ought not to. Moving on to the next passage. There is a simple truth which one can learn only through suffering. In war, not victories are blessed, but defeats. Governments need victories and the people need defeats. Victory gives rise to the desire for more victories. But after a defeat, it is freedom that men desire and usually attain. A people needs defeat just as an individual needs suffering and misfortune. They compel the deepening of the inner life and generate a spiritual upsurge. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we come to the final passage in the wisdom gained through suffering section of this video. And it is the last passage we will go over in this video. And it reads, if only it were all so simple. If only there were evil people somewhere insidiously committing evil deeds, and it were necessary only to separate them from the rest of us and destroy them. But the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being. And who is willing to destroy a piece of his own heart? During the life of any heart, this line keeps changing place. Sometimes it is squeezed one way by exuberant evil, and sometimes it shifts to allow enough space for good to flourish. One and the same human being is, at various stages, under various circumstances, a totally different human being. At times he is close to being a devil, at times to sainthood. But his name doesn't change, and to that name we ascribe the whole lot, good and evil. Socrates taught us, know thyself. I feel like that is a good passage to end on, um, because it is 100% true. We are capable of sainthood and of absolute devilry. We could, you and me, who have never, uh, you know, never been a guard at uh, any camp anywhere, um, we could be brought to, we could end up being that way. We could shift the line inside our hearts to allow that sort of evil to happen. And we could also shift the line in our hearts to say no to that kind of evil. The point is, is that people often think of, you know, the Nazis as, oh, there, there are these, there are these other like species of human. They're just, they were just came out of the womb rotten. Not the case. Uh, I haven't read this book, but there's a book called uh, Ordinary Men by Daniel Browning, where he talks about how um, the Nazi prison guards were actually ordinary men who loved ordinary things. But through a slow process of, you know, uh, indoctrination and, you know, just uh, mind games that they played on themselves, they were able to get themselves to do some of the most heinous acts against humanity ever in the history of humanity. We're all capable of, uh, of good and evil. And uh, we must know thyself. We must know this about us. Because if we refuse to acknowledge that uh, we are capable of great good and great evil. If we refuse to acknowledge that, we are bound to find ourselves uh, in a place we don't want to be, 
doing things we would have never thought us capable of doing.